Okay, so our next speaker is Simon Nelson, who is the CEO for FutureLearn. So I'm really delighted to welcome Simon to our afternoon session. As you know, I'm sure FutureLearn was the first UK provider for MOOCs, and we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> uh, can people hear me okay at the back? Good. Uh, okay, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, in Manchester. Um, I actually grew up around here. Um, I went to school uh, just down the road, Manchester Grammar School, uh, down in Russia, and for those who know it. Uh, my first job uh, when I came back from university was um, for DIMP, oh, uh, where, well, I did a, uh, uh, an MBA, part-time MBA, at Manchester Business School, just uh, not far away, uh, which I'm very proud of, over three years. Uh, and I was doing that while working for the uh, world-famous Dimples Wigs and Toupees in Carrington. Uh, so if you don't know this, this is opposite Manchester United's training ground and um, is about the third biggest, or was at the time, uh, wholesaler of wigs and toupees in the UK. Um, and um, I, uh, I come from uh, uh, Hale, um, which is about 10 miles down the road where my mum and dad live which is famous for drunken footballers now. Um, so, uh, having left Manchester, that's extremely kind, thank you, um, I uh, went to work at the BBC, I was just waving at a uh, former colleague there, um, and um, uh, I worked there for 15 years. And I headed up all digital activity, first for uh, BBC Radio. Um, so I was head of strategy, just as the internet was uh, getting into our consciousness, really. Uh, and so was then given the chance to set up and run all the BBC's digital services for the radio and the music part of the organisation. Um, and uh, at the time, all the fever and the hype, fervour and hype about digital in radio was that it spelt the end of radio, as we know it anyway. Um, and that was something I never believed. Um, I always believed, certainly, that if the industry as a whole and the BBC within it grabbed hold of the opportunities that digital presented, they could actually emerge stronger. And I believe uh, we did uh, through uh, radio on demand, podcasting, uh, and the interactive uh, extensions to radio that are now just part of the fabric of all of our listening. I then moved, uh, after 10 years in radio, to head up all uh, digital content for uh, all of BBC television uh, and uh, broader services including children's education etc um, and at that time the hype was even greater the arrival of digital and TV unquestionably meant the death of the key planks of TV that we all knew and loved at the time so no more channels uh, no more um, um, no more live television who would tune in for live TV certain genres would disappear so who would want live entertainment anymore? Who would want uh, factual programming, etc. in a world where you could have Netflix or YouTube on demand? Uh, again, of course, I never believed in that. Uh, and I was part of the team that developed the iPlayer uh, and a whole range of other digital services that I believe has uh, given BBC TV a strong platform for the future as well. Um, so then, uh, just over two years ago, I first heard this bizarre acronym, MOOC, um, which I said to someone the other day, and they said it, sa it sounds like some sort of weird cyber pet. Um, and uh, my reaction was, uh, look, we're now going to test whether the audio works. Uh, my reaction was a little bit like this. All right, we're not going to pay. We're not paying. No, for what? We're just saying we're going to have a drink. We're not paying because this guy, this guy is a fucking MOOC. But I didn't say that. We don't pay moves. Moves. I'm a moves. Yeah. What's a move? Move. What's a move? I don't know. What's a move? <laughs> you can't call me a move. I can't. No. I need a move. <laughs> uh, courtesy of Martin Scorsese uh, and Mean Streets, about 1973. Um, so, uh, I was introduced to the term by the uh, Vice-Chancellor of the Open University, Martin Bean, 
um, and started to get my head around it. He asked me if I wanted to set up and uh, lead a UK response to the phenomenon that was growing in the US. Uh, so by the middle of uh, uh, that, that first year, um, we'd managed to get on Newsnight, uh, and which brought Jeremy Paxman into the mix. Now, supposing that instead of going to live in some crummy bedsit in pot noodle land, so you can have the privilege of listening to it turned out happy the same lecture he's been delivering for the last 20 years, suppose instead of that, you could stay at home and hear some of the best lecturers in the world. The idea of MOOCs, massive open online courses, seems to some to promise a new future for higher education, an alternative to an expensive traditional one. An alternative to an expensive traditional uh, uh, higher education, uh, which of course has been all the hype that has therefore accompanied MOOCs, or particularly did around that period, 2013 um, this was. Um, and. Uh, it just felt a little bit like Groundhog Day for me uh, from the experience I'd had at the BBC and then working in other sectors. Uh, because I found uh, in this sector, as in others, that the argument just got ridiculously polarised uh, between um, sceptics and evangelists. Uh, the evangelists did predict, make the most wild predictions of the benefits of MOOCs, um, literally claiming uh, that... Uh, it could be one of the most significant factors in solving world poverty in the New York Times. Uh, and you all heard it, and you all heard the glee with which some uh, new digital gurus were predicting the sweeping away of the traditional university system. But what happens on the other end of it? And we heard about that debate that was happening a few years ago. Well, people just retreat to the other end of the spectrum uh, and start dismissing the whole thing as a fad um, or... Uh, uh, that the teaching, start dismissing the teaching as overly simplistic, um, start focusing on the low completion rates and dismissing them on that basis, and, as we just heard then, dismissing them as just marketing, as if universities have never had to market themselves. But anyway, um, so um, my own view, as you can guess, is somewhere in the middle of this, um, but really, my view is it's not about MOOCs, it's about the internet. And we could have a long and probably pointless debate about MOOCs and their overall impact, but I suspect that very few of you would argue with me that the internet is hitting higher education in a big way, is here to stay, and its impact is going to be far more fundamental than any of the stuff we've been talking about with MOOCs. And I think MOOCs are a very, very exciting powerful manifestation of this transformation that's hitting higher education. Um, and to come to the sort of topic of what we're talking about today, um, I just, I hate that sort of reductive, you know, death of university, death of TV, death of radio nonsense. Because for me, it's about opportunities. It always was in the media, and it is now. An opportunity to transform the experience. Um, I won't I can't get sucked into going through each one of these, but it's sort of a model that I've used uh, since first trying to get my head around how in BBC Radio we should grapple with all the opportunities in front of us um, and how it should impact on radio stations, the way they make content, etc. And these have held true for me when I went into TV, and I think they hold true for me now. The opportunities to transform the experience for learners are quite amazing. Uh, and so I get particularly grumpy when people sort of dismiss all that as a fad and don't quite grab hold of the opportunity. And if we're talking about quality, therefore, I think it's critical to put the learner at the centre of that and say, in my view, there is an opportunity to utterly transform the quality of the experience for the learner. So people keep asking me whether we've set up Future Learn as an alternative to universities, whether we want to be a university. And they keep saying, no, not at all. Uh, and in fact, all of our partners are universities. We're trying to help them navigate their way through this mass of opportunities uh, and potential pitfalls. But one of the ways in which we try and sort of differentiate ourselves and uh, keep ourselves sane in this uh, sort of world of possibility is... Um, by putting the learner first. 
And I think in terms of addressing the question of this uh, conference, quality matters, I believe if one puts the learner first, then there's some quite interesting answers that come out. So I'm now going to talk a bit about future learn and how we try and do that. Three key ways that we're trying to put the learner first in our platform. Firstly, by creating a simple, delightful, flexible user experience. One that means you can learn as easily on a mobile phone as you can on a desktop. Uh, and of course, that takes your learning anywhere and any when, sorry, um, uh, you would like it to be. Um, we've tried to make the experience of doing a course as simple as possible. We've tried to take as much off the screen as you can to really focus the learner on what's important and help them to understand how to progress through courses, what they've got to do next, how well they're doing, and encourage them through, through a variety of techniques. And there is an underlying learning design in this whole uh, information architecture. So we've been able to work with the Open University, its leading uh, educational scientists, to try and embed some of their thinking and philosophies in the way that we deliver courses. Um, it doesn't come easily. Making something simple is really, really complicated. Uh, and in some ways, uh, deciding what to leave off is the hardest thing. So. Uh, I've got a fantastic design and usability team, uh, user experience team, uh, and I think they, we think very, very deeply, sometimes too deeply, uh, and therefore sometimes a bit slower than we'd like, about every bloody aspect we can about how to put the learner first in our experience. We aren't there yet, but we think we're doing pretty well. We try and sketch out their journeys, think of all the possible, possible paths, make sure that experience is simple and clear. And we're trying to add colour and bring a bit of delight and enjoyment to the learning experience. Because my personal use of many e-learning platforms uh, has felt akin to filling in my tax return. <laughs> Not because of the content that's in them, but because the technology just gets in the way. And we don't want the technology to get in the way of our partner's content. <coughs> so, um, please, you know, you can hear my spiel. The only way you're going to test this is by trying them out yourselves. How many of you have done a FutureLearn course? How many of you have even dipped in? Please do. Those who haven't, I expect to see a little spike in registrations from <laughs> Manchester. Um, and... Um, I'll tell you some other things to look out for in a minute. So um, we um, also believe in putting the learner um, at the heart of the learning experience. So it not just being teacher-led, not just being uh, instruction that is delivered to the learner and they then go away, but actually making the experience genuinely social. Now, we try to learn from social networks and bring some of the principles of that social network with which the audience is now increasingly familiar into future learn. So everyone has a profile page uh, and people can uh, follow each other, they can like each other's comments, they can reply directly to each other and they can filter a massive conversation down to something more manageable for them. And the principle we're trying to get to is that the learners teach each other and that the content that the teacher or instructor puts in there is merely the spark that ignites the conversation, which is where the learning really happens. This is all based on underlying philosophies uh, of the Open University and I suspect espoused by many of the people in this room. Um, so, um, we also, uh, in structuring the content, we made sure that this experience isn't taking place on a separate message board in a separate area. Every bit of content on the platform has a discussion alongside it, which takes place in context. And we encourage people to join that debate, to comment themselves, to see what other people are saying, as well as then to take advantage of all these social network type features uh, to filter what can become a huge overwhelming conversation if you're not careful. 
Uh, we don't think with a finished article here. Actually, these tools are pretty rudimentary, but they seem to be really working, and audiences, learners, seem to be responding incredibly enthusiastically to them. A uh, few examples. Fantastic creative writing course from Open University. Uh, 9,000 comments uh, ended up on this step, uh, which encouraged people to just write a short paragraph uh, with one fact and three uh, uh, elements of fiction. And uh, 9,000 uh, either individual bits of writing or comments on those bits of writing. Um, and not random YouTube comments. Really high quality stuff. And this is one of the things, if you don't believe me, go and look any one of our courses. And I hope and think you'll see that kind of debate going on. Uh, at another end of the spectrum, um, Bath uh, University ran. Oh God, I, I, I said Bath then. God, that shows I have been down south for <laughs> 20 years. Sorry, Bath University. Um, so, ran a course on uh, cancer uh, awareness and um, the educator of that course said what we hear from many of our educators. The beginning, as they started going through the process with us, they were terrified of what was coming and really uh, you know, thought it was going to be incredibly daunting, a huge amount of work, etc. And at the end of the process said it was one of the most rewarding experiences of their teaching career. And the reason uh, this person said back to us was that they'd never before taught in a community where you had fellow academics, students, sufferers, families of sufferers, recovered sufferers, all coming together, sharing, debating different aspects of cancer treatment and care. Whole different uh, uh, example here. Exploring English language and culture from the British Council. It's our bit, biggest course so far. 120,000 people plus signed up for it. Uh, from just about every country in the world. Uh, and its aim was to use our social learning techniques to encourage people to develop their English language, take it onto the next level. Uh, some fantastic examples in here, too small for you to see, but you can have these slides after. Um, uh, so uh, this, this guy um, got into a conversation with the educator, who's based around here actually, um, where he said, uh, the learner said that he, he only learned English uh, in case he ever met Mick Jagger. <laughs> and uh, so the educator says, of course. So, so uh, did that ever happen? And it did. <laughs> and the guy then tells the story of actually how Mick Jagger came to, uh, was in Singapore with the Rolling Stones, staying in the same hotel. The guy went up, talked to the bouncer, convinced him that he was genuine and got to meet Mick. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there's another lovely thread here, again, sorry, too small, but uh, just people comparing how you say ha 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 in different languages. And uh, it's different, and we had no idea when we started the course that this was the way it was going to go, but people loved it. Um, and, you know, he's, uh, the guy also used other um, uh, sites to encourage people to co co communicate and join in in some way. So he asked them all to send in a photo from where they were learning at that moment. We think some of them used a bit of uh, poetic license, but um, uh, but it is you know magical to see a global community like this learning live come together. So finally, putting the learner first um, in terms of content and the content we deliver. So we have never believed that MOOCs should be about just recording lectures and pumping them out over the internet. The internet is a creative, connected, participative medium and the content needs to uh, understand that, respond to it. Um, and um, again, I'd say we're only scratching the surface so far. We're nowhere near fulfilling the potential of what the web can offer in terms of new forms of learning content. But we've made a good start. Um, so uh, we have very few examples of where people are just filming lectures and delivering them. Uh, we work very closely with our academics and their project teams to think through uh, how exactly to present their courses, their ideas, and deliver real effective learning outcomes. Um, so I could go through loads of uh, videos. Um, I'm not going to. That's a quick snippet of one lovely course.
Paris Peace Conference marked the new beginning, the League of Nations was to provide the framework for the new world order. For the first time in history, the nations of the world would unite in a world organization. At the time, not everybody was enthusiastic. Now this is one of the iconic photos of the Paris Peace Conference. It shows the four political leaders that determined the fate of the conference. Forgive me, I'm running out of time, so I'm, uh, I'm just going to skip through. But um, the, the reason I illustrate that one is just to also emphasize we're not talking about music video quality content here. We're talking about imagination and uh, storytelling, uh, as Grania uh, th uh, th happily um, repeated to you. Uh, one of the things we try and put at the center of our conversations with academics. Uh, we also want to get our content much more interactive, so not just about watching video, but actually playing with, interacting with real content. Hadrian's Wall, fantastic course from Newcastle, um, and one where we help them overlay their archaeological site uh, uh, maps and images uh, on uh, Google Maps, and actually create interactive steps uh, within the course where people were encouraged to analyse and uh, uh, identify different buildings, different um, aspects of the archaeological sites that remain around Hadrian's Wall. And again, the audience loved it. Um, great course on forensic science running from Strathclyde at the moment. One of the reasons I highlight it is gets people doing stuff, getting them away from the computer and actually encouraging to, them to learn through taking their own fingerprints, uh, testing their own DNA and their family's DNA. Um, the wonderful uh, University of Leicester, um, which uh, has created, uh, I love the way Grania said, yeah, no, they were about, at the end of our course, they were about 48% still there. Yeah, that, that's about the best future loan course there's been. Uh, that is an amazing figure for a six or eight week course, six week. Yeah. Um, and again, lovely bits of interaction in here. One, one being um, encouraging people to cook the food from the period of Richard III, uh, which they then share on Flickr. As people who build their first mobile game with Reading share those games on Google Play, download them, rate each other's games. People who do Monash's creative coding course share the beautiful images that they create from their code on Tumblr and people doing the OU's Orion course at the moment share the images they've captured uh, of um, the stars. So um, this approach uh, we believe is working. So um, we launched our first course uh, about a year and a quarter ago. We ran a few pilot courses but we've only really been running courses in earnest for a year now. Um, we've got um, We'll hit 900,000 people um, in the next few days, uh, signed up to 2 million course runs. Um, that's from just about every country in the world, uh, but more heavily now international than the UK. Uh, and we buck uh, the traditional stereotype of MOOCs, that they're for young males. Uh, so uh, far more women take Futureland courses than men. Um, and uh, this is a phenomenon that is attracting people beyond university age uh, and actually uh, I think that is an amazing opportunity for a university to think about reinventing its role in society because the appetite for learning I guess I don't need to talk to this audience about this uh, among the rest of the population is all over the world is incredible um, and our own completion figures, um, so I'm very public on these, uh, it is a challenge, no doubt. These are free online courses. Lots of people join them, but then don't even start the course. So we lose 45% um, of people before the course even starts. So as a result, we benchmark all our figures against those people who started courses. Um, we set ourselves quite a high bar uh, in that we ask everyone uh, who's doing a course to 
actively mark when they've watched a piece of video, uh, done a discussion step, read an article, taken a test, so that we can track them. And uh, just under half of people do that in more than one week. Um, but our key metric is people who mark more than half the steps in the course as done and do all of the assessments in a course. Uh, that was 22%, it's now actually 23% of people who start the course do that. If you're a fan of these completion figures and want to have a think about benchmarking between different MOOC platforms, everyone uses apples and pears, um, but many uh, benchmark against joiners, not people who started the course. That figure is about 12% of joiners. Still quite some way from the 4 or 5% that you might have heard quoted or the 98% dropout we just heard. Uh, and part of the reason we think platform's working, although again, <coughs> I think we've got a long way to go, is that emphasis on the social learning aspect. So 40% of people who um, take one of our courses actively write in those um, discussion areas. Many more are reading uh, and uh, vicariously learning from what others are doing. Now, um, at the BBC, um, I built, or I didn't personally, can't personally build anything, but I was involved in the development of many great products, and since the BBC, I've never seen social engagement like that. Uh, and so I feel, it makes us feel we're onto something. Not that, it's not the end of the university, but for those imaginative universities who are prepared to put digital at the heart of what they're doing, I think it's an opportunity to reinvent their work role. I could and would go on and on and on, but I'm gonna stop there because uh, I've ex uh, exceeded my time. So thank you very much. So I remember, um, I remember I personally got very excited about it. Someone, uh, someone actually came up with the idea of uh, asking J.K. Rowling if we could use a sorting hat analogy in it. And, um, and when I actually got excited about that, my development team turned around and said, Simon, we were joking. Don't ever, <laughs> ever bring that up again. I like, All right. um, so uh, I think there's two, there's two challenges there. First, I think that um, as the thinking's developed, we thought that actually we prefer massive audiences to come together with disparate um, learning styles. Um, but we, we would like the ability to filter off into smaller groups and create that kind of uh, experience alongside. But that relates to the second point, which is that um, once you build something like this, uh, it becomes increasingly hard to just uh, layer more and more things on top of it without creating, um, while keeping in line with a high quality user experience. So uh, that kind of thing is on the roadmap, but there's some really, really other important things on that roadmap as well. So uh, I'd say, yes, uh, those kind of innovations are definitely on a long-term roadmap and watch this space over the next couple of years for how we innovate in social learning. Um, but also, we now have the, the challenge of managing a platform with nearly a million registered learners. So. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm just
unquestionably. And, uh, you know, a lot of our most successful courses, I think, are uh, in that kind of area. So, um, uh, and, you know, some of the most overwhelmingly sort of positive and exciting feedback we get is from people exactly like you who, um, although, sorry, maybe not exactly like you, just that, because it, presumably you're in academia in some way, um, uh, but people who thought that, you know, they'd never have the chance to learn in this kind of way again or may never have had the opportunity to learn at university or did a survey on this recently and uh, the number of people who think that you know who either didn't go to university and wish they had uh, or think they did the wrong subject at university you know is, is huge and significant and um, and I think that um, we have learners of all ages from sort of you know 17 to 97 uh, who are doing this for a variety of motivations now, I should say, you know, we are a um, commercial subsidiary of the OU. So our job is to turn this into a sustainable business. And it's a, forgive the jargon, freemium um, uh, operation. So the courses are free and will remain so. Uh, but the, the, the proof of learning is something that uh, we charge for. So at the moment, pretty crude. Uh, so there's a basic statement of participation if you're eligible you can buy for 29 pound now the reason I put mention that in this context is we assumed that um, we would sell most of those on courses that were clearly related to professional development and there's no doubt that um, proportionally uh, our portfolio of healthcare courses uh, and business courses you know do sell those particularly well but we've also had fantastic courses from uh, University of Leicester, Granny's gone, even so I'll still say it, um, uh, so England in the time of Richard III, brilliant course on uh, Irish history from Trinity uh, College Dublin, uh, fantastic course in Hadrian's Wall from uh, Newcastle, and we sold very significant amounts of statements on those. Uh, and. That's not for professional development, we don't think. Although we think there may be some teachers who may be doing it. But, um, but actually, when we try and get underneath the motivations of that, it's people who've just had a fantastic experience and want some sort of memento or signal of it. So um, it's one of those things we're grappling with sort of as a business as well. But um, uh, no, we, the motivations of our learners and the feedback we get, you're absolutely not alone. So there's courses in here for you if you haven't done any yet. Can we take one more question and then we'll break for lunch? I saw a hand up over there very early on. Break for lunch? Gosh, uh, break, for lunch. <laughs> break for refreshments. <laughs> Is there any uh, possible futures in linking this with uh, mass media like TV? Because uh, it would be great to do uh, uh, watch a programme, say, on the tubers on the telly, on an iPad, and then link it to something like maybe the cookie, and you can go straight through and take a course because you're doing it for fun. Um, or you could link it into some, some other way. So you, it groups seem to be in isolation at the moment, so they need to be more joined up with other things that are out there on the internet. So, uh, God, yeah, that, that's a whole area of the presentation. that I, I did actually have some slides in on it, um, but that would have taken me forever. So, in summary, totally, totally agree with you. Um, we have, however, always put that at the front of what we're doing. We see the university really at the heart of a network of relationships and partnerships with content owners, cultural bodies, businesses, uh, in order to uh, connect into those worlds and potentially create a bigger sort of knowledge offer uh, on the web based around what we're doing. Now, um, so we have as partners already the British Library, British Museum, British Council. Uh, the BBC has done um, four courses with four different universities. So that little snippet from um, uh, Glasgow's World War I course on uh, Versailles Treaty um, was in conjunction with the BBC, took BBC archive material um, and actually worked with the storytellers at the BBC and four courses are brilliant. And we're working with the Beeb next year, uh, this year, on um, a year of digital creativity so we're trying to um, collaborate to bring uh, a whole range of courses out under that umbrella of something they're running uh, elsewhere. And yeah, my vision absolutely is to connect it to a three-week, six-week series uh, on BBC One, BBC Two, 
uh, and you know we know from having run parts of the BBC website you know there's only so much the BBC can do on its own website and I think that's probably relatively informal education uh, and so actually then bridging into this kind of world that we do and then bridging into the university sector is I think a wonderful sort of uh, pyramid for where we go I could go on about that but um, yeah totally agree Thank you very much. We, we really should break for refreshments. Uh, so coffee and tea will be down um, in the reception area and there's some cakes as well. Please look at the posters and the exhibition stands. And thank you again very much. Well,